I crawled in a bed with who I thought was my wife. I'm 26 years old and have married Lucy, 25, for three years. We have no kids and are not planning on any. Here's what happened. I have a job that requires me to travel about one weekend every four to six weeks. I leave on Friday morning and return early Monday morning, around 2 a.m. Lucy is almost always asleep, so I crawl into bed with her and we wake up together on Monday morning. I have two days off after the work trip. We finish the work early this time, and I return a day earlier. Most of the time, I'm traveling in a no-cell reception zone, so I couldn't communicate that I would return home earlier. This has happened before. I came in at 2 a.m. on Sunday, crawled into bed, and hugged my wife, feeling that she was naked. Being the man that I am, of course, I grabbed her boobs. She's my wife, after all. I heard her moan, and Lucy said, Just stay put, sweetheart. I'll be right back. I watched Lucy get up and stand there, completely exposed. I couldn't help but say, You look stunning. When I said that, Lucy turned around as if she'd been stung by a bee and stared at me in shock. It took me a few seconds to comprehend. If Lucy is standing in front of the bed, who am I holding? I quickly sat up and looked at the person, the naked person, I was holding, who was still sleeping in my arms with my hand on her chest. It was Amy, 24, Lucy's best friend. I just shouted, What the hell is going on here? This woke Amy up, and she jumped up and ran to Lucy. They both ran to the bathroom. I could hear them talking in panic, but couldn't understand what they were saying. I went to the living room. I was exhausted from work, having slept for close to 24 hours, and I had to comprehend what had just happened. I sat on my recliner with my face buried in my hands. After a few minutes, I felt her hand on my shoulder. I looked up and saw Lucy crying, which confirmed that I was not mistaken. I am grateful they did not try to gaslight me. With my lack of sleep and exhaustion, they could have easily fooled me into thinking it was something innocent. Both Lucy and Amy were now dressed. Amy stood behind the sofa, and Lucy kneeled beside me. Looking back, Lucy's body language was concerned and caring, not defensive and ready to flee. I was honestly too tired to be angry, so I calmly asked, How long? Lucy replied, A couple of months. During my work trips? I asked. Lucy nodded. Yes. Has there been anyone else? I asked. Lucy shook her head. No. I'm going to bed. I'm exhausted. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Amy, I don't want you here tomorrow, I said. I went to bed and fell asleep almost immediately. The following day, Lucy was at the breakfast table waiting for me. I'm still determining where she slept or if she slept at all. As I had wished, Amy was not here. I made a coffee, sat down, and said, all right, you must explain everything. After that, I want to hear why I shouldn't divorce you and, finally, what you plan to do to fix this. Something you should know about me. I have calm anger. I don't shout, but my voice does change and sound harsher and more stern. That is the only way I can explain it. Lucy started by telling me she was bisexual and that she and Amy had been having an emotional affair for a while. It only turned physical during one of my work trips at the beginning of the year, when they had a movie night and much wine. She said it wasn't planned. It just happened. That's when I interrupted. I had suspected her orientation since college. But it wasn't my place to bring it up. But I wanted to know why she never told me. So early in our friendship, before we even had a relationship, a friend made a joke about bisexuals being suitable for threesomes, but not for relationships. And I laughed. This has never been my thought process, but at the time, I thought the joke was funny. I had no idea how it affected the way Lucy saw me. I thought the joke was funny. I, I told her, it just happened. It might fly the first time, but every time after that was planned. Why should I not divorce you, my unfaithful wife? She began to tell me how much she loved me, how it was a mistake, how she could only see a future with me, how happy I made her, and on and on. I cut her off. You need to try harder. I'm hearing plenty of reasons that benefit you. But I'm not hearing a single reason for me to stay in this marriage. I'm the one who was betrayed. And I'm not hearing why I should stay. Then I asked, What are you planning to do to make this right? My trust in you is gone. I can't go on a work trip without worrying about your actions. You say there hasn't been anyone else. How am I supposed to trust that's true? So tell me, 
How will you rebuild the trust you've destroyed? She listed many things, giving me access to all her devices, sharing her location through her smartwatch, installing cameras in the house, and having friends drop by unexpectedly when I'm on a trip. She even suggested joining me on my work trips and staying in the hotel the whole weekend. So, you suggest turning our home into a prison with me as the warden. Tell me, do you think the warden trusts his inmates? Don't you think he knows that they'll return to their old ways when he turns his back or lets up? I've heard enough for today. I'll give you another chance to answer my last two questions in a few days. For now, I think it is best to give me some space. I said. She got up and started walking to the bedroom, and then I added, You've offered all these promises to make things right, but you haven't mentioned cutting ties with Amy. I haven't decided whether I want a divorce yet, but if you stay at Amy's these next few days, the divorce is a sure thing. There will be no coming back from that. She left and I broke down crying. I'm not cold or heartless. That's just a defense mechanism. I was a mess all Sunday and Monday, so I took the rest of the week off. I cleaned the house and the garden by Thursday and texted her, saying she could come over on Saturday to talk. If she didn't come or didn't reschedule, I would assume she had given up on us. She arrived at our home around 8.30 a.m., which was very early. I let her in, and she sat on the sofa while I made her a cup of coffee. Where did you stay this week? I asked. At my sister's, she replied. What did you tell her? Only we are having trouble, and you need some space. Did you see Amy? No, not even a text, she said, taking out her phone to offer it to me. But I declined. I told you. I'm not going to play the role of warden, I said. So, do you trust me? She asked. No, I replied. Then how will you ever trust me again, if you won't even check my phone? I do not need to do anything to regain trust. I wasn't the one who broke it. You're the one who has to do the work, I said. But how? She asked. I don't know. You spent time and energy sneaking around behind my back. Use that same energy to figure out how to rebuild the trust. This is your mess, so if you want to fix it, you have to do the work. I don't have to do anything, I said. You could meet me halfway, she suggested. I already am. I'm giving you a chance to make things right, I replied. The issue wasn't the sex with Amy. If she had told me after the first time when it just happened, we could have worked it out. The problem was the betrayal of my trust. The problem was doing everything behind my back, keeping it a secret from me, her husband. She broke down crying when I told her this. I told her I was giving her three months to regain my trust. If, after three months, I still can't trust her, I'll file for divorce. I know three months is a long time, but I want to give her a real chance. Because the truth is, I still love her. But if there is no trust after three months, I will file for divorce. I'll give her one courtesy. She can come up with a reason for our divorce. That doesn't have to be accurate. I don't want to ruin her reputation with friends and family. But if the new story puts me in a bad light, I'll tell everyone the real story. It's been six months since D-Day, and yet we got divorced. Lucy did try hard to save our marriage. She put in the effort, no doubt about it. When Lucy returned home, I didn't ask her to move to the guest bedroom, so she stayed in our bed. As a small sign of protest, I started wearing pajamas. We always slept either naked or just in boxers. The pajamas were a clear message. Of course, I couldn't keep that up for long. Even though I didn't want to play detective, she was constantly sharing her location, giving me updates and texting me about everything she was doing. I never asked, but she did change her phone password to something I would remember, and she told me about it. So, I had access to her phone and other devices. In those months, I took her phone once, and it was to order a pizza because my battery was dead. For a while, I thought maybe, just maybe, we could make it work. But then came the final straw. A few weeks later, Lucy attended a family event I couldn't participate in. No big deal, right? She told me about it beforehand, like she'd been doing with everything else. But what she didn't mention was that Amy was there too. I only found out about it when I saw a post from Amy on Instagram. There wasn't even a picture of the two together, but I recognized the place and realized Lucy had been there. If I hadn't known better, I would have just scrolled past it without a second thought. Here's the thing. I never told Lucy what she could or couldn't do or that she should warn me if she ran into Amy. The only thing I told her was that actions have consequences. She can do whatever she wants but must live with the consequences. When I asked Lucy about it, she insisted she didn't even talk to Amy. 
She said they just happened to be at the same event, and that was it. And honestly, I did believe her. But her not telling me Amy was there felt like she was hiding it from me. Now, every time she leaves the house, I have this uneasy feeling. I don't know where she's going, and I don't know if I can trust that she's doing what she says she's doing. That tiny seed of doubt was still there and kept growing. That's when I knew it didn't matter what she said or did. I couldn't trust her anymore. And I didn't know if that could be fixed. She started crying when I told Lucy I couldn't do it anymore. It was heartbreaking. She still loved me. And I loved her. She cried in my arms for hours. She kept saying, I'm sorry. And I love you. After a few hours, she fell asleep crying. I carried her to bed, packed a few things, and left. The divorce was amicable and took just a few weeks. We decided to tell everyone that we just grew apart. It's easier that way. No drama, no messy explanations. Only Lucy, Amy, and I know the real story. And that's how it ends. I don't hate Lucy, and I know she tried, but sometimes, once trust is gone, there's no going back. We're going our separate ways now, and hopefully... We both find some peace down the road. The divorce was finalized, and a few weeks later, I saw Lucy walking hand in hand with Amy. That's when I knew I had to leave. That Monday, I went to work and put in for a transfer out of state. I explicitly told them I wanted the transfer immediately. Two days later, it was approved, and two weeks after that, I left for the satellite office. Yes, it was swift, but I'm good with the people in HR, and they did me a favor by pushing my request. This is my first night in my new apartment in a new state. God, I miss Lucy. I'm going to get drunk tonight. Tomorrow is a new day. It has been five years, and I have moved twice more since then. A few weeks after my first move, my buddy Dan told me that Lucy had been looking for me. She wanted to know where I had gone, but Dan could not tell her because he did not know. I had left so suddenly that I did not tell anyone where I was going. At the time... I just wanted to leave my old life behind. The first few months after the move were rough. When I was with Lucy, I loved trying new things with her, like traveling to unfamiliar cities, discovering new restaurants, and ordering the most unusual items on the menu. New experiences were always tied to her. After the divorce, I moved to a new state and city, transferred to a new office, and found myself exploring new bars, clubs, and restaurants. All of it reminded me of Lucy. Over time, I was able to enjoy things again without the constant reminder of my ex-wife, and life started to get better. As the new guy and the youngest middle manager in the office, I became famous. I never dated anyone from work, but I met many new people through my colleagues, including a few women I casually dated. I was not looking for anything serious then, and they respected that. Being an only child with no parents left, I had nothing tying me down. So... I kept moving twice more while continuing to work for the same company. For my last move, I decided to live somewhere warmer and closer to the coast. Before committing to the move, I traveled there for a company project and volunteered so I could explore the area. Afterward, I requested a transfer, and a few weeks later, I made the move. In the last few years, I have changed a bit. I grew a goatee, which my barber calls the Tony Stark. I finally got the tattoo I had always wanted stretching from my chest to my upper arm. While I have always been in good shape, I changed my workout routine to bulk up a little but not too much. And now for the actual update. I made a few friends at the office who are as loud and fun as I am. So we went to a local bar with a live rock cover band. It was a great night filled with drinking, singing with the band, and being the lively crowd that bands love to have around. It was almost midnight when I heard a woman call my name in a questioning tone, as if she wasn't sure it was me. I noticed my friend's reactions, and from their expressions, I knew a beautiful woman was standing behind me. As I turned around, I said something corny and cocky, like, that's my name, and you will remember it at breakfast. When I finally faced her, I froze. It was Lucy, and with a teasing smile, she replied, I already know your name, but I hope to repeat it at breakfast. She looked incredible. Maybe it was the alcohol talking. Or perhaps it was because it had been four years, but she was even more stunning than I remembered. She hugged me, and I was so taken aback that I didn't react appropriately. I gave her a weak hug, which probably appeared as if I didn't want to hug her. I turned to the guys and said, Everyone, I'm calling it a night. Rob, can you cover my tap? 
I will pay you back later. I took a few steps, and Lucy looked down as if she thought I was walking away. I turned back, took her hand, and asked, Are you coming? Her smile could have lit up the entire room. She quickly said goodbye to her friends and walked outside with me. In my not-so-sober state, I thought it was evident that I wanted her to come with me. It looked like I was going to leave her behind. The night was warm, with a cool breeze by the water, and I took her for a walk. We talked briefly about our careers, and she mentioned that she had moved here two and a half years ago. After she broke up with Amy, she had no reason to stay, so she found a new challenge and relocated. I had no idea she was here, and maybe that was for the best. I would not have moved here if I had known, but now I am glad I did. That night, we talked about many things, including relationships. I told her I had not been in town long enough to start anything serious, and she mentioned she was casually seeing someone, but they both knew it wasn't going anywhere. When we arrived at her apartment, it was time to say goodbye. I had already decided I would ask her out again, but it lasted too long when we hugged, and we both knew it wasn't just a hug. It lasted way too long when we hugged. While we were still holding each other, she looked up at me and said, I want to make you breakfast. The following day, I woke up in her bed, greeted by the smell of freshly brewed coffee. That was a year ago. Not long after that, I moved in with Lucy. We told our friends part of the story, that we used to be married, grew apart, and found each other again. Amy contacted Lucy out of the blue a month ago using a new number. She said she would visit the city and wanted to meet up. Lucy politely replied that, out of respect for our rekindled relationship, she did not think staying in contact was a good idea. After that, she blocked Amy's number. We are looking for a more prominent place because Lucy is pregnant.